15 minute or less lecture series, anatomy and physiology, chapter 11, endocrine system. The endocrine system is made up of cells, tissues, and organs that secrete hormones. There are two main types of glands, exocrine glands that secrete stuff onto a surface and endocrine glands that secrete hormones into either the interstitial fluid around the structure or directly into the bloodstream. Uh, endocrine system is similar to the nervous system in that they both are communicating signals throughout the body with the goal of homeostasis, maintaining homeostasis. However, the nervous system is super fast, utilizing neurons for short, quick responses. The endocrine system is super slow, sending out the uh, chemicals, the hormones into the bloodstream to affect the receptors on their target cells. Only target cells receptors will respond. So it's a slow, longer response. Endocrine cells secrete hormones, uh, targeting cells with receptors. Uh, the hormone secretion is regulated by a self-adjusting mechanism. Again, the negative feedback loop. Uh, so that basically, as things return to normal, we are turning it off, and as Fears away from normal, we're turning it on. Hormones can be steroids or they can be non steroids, which includes amines, peptides, and proteins, all or glycoproteins, all derivatives of amino acids or groups of amino acids. Um, you only need a tiny amount because they're only targeting specific cells. Steroid hormones are originated as cholesterol. Uh, they are lipid soluble, so they can pass through the cell membrane and they have to be carried on plasma proteins because lipid. Uh, lipids are hydrophobic, and they steroids end up targeting receptors in the target cell's nucleus, thereby affecting which genes are activated. Examples of steroids include estrogen, testosterone, aldosterone, and cortisol. So, steroid arrives, it passes through the cell membrane, goes into the nucleus, there it will bind to a particular protein that will then activate or deactivate a specific gene. If it activates a gene, the new messenger RNA is produced. That messenger RNA goes out into the cytoplasm and produces new proteins. Non-steroid hormones, on the other hand, cannot pass through the cell membrane, so instead they bind to receptors on the cell membrane. And the hormone receptor complex leads to what's called signal transduction as the signal is passed across the membrane to activate or suppress proteins within the cytoplasm. As you can see, uh, non-steroid hormones are all derivatives of amino acids or uh, proteins. So non-steroid hormone binds to the receptor. This leads to the activation of a G protein that causes secant to be developed, which leads to activation or inactivation of various proteins, leading to further and further cellular changes. So non-steroid hormones can only affect proteins that are already present in the cytoplasm. Uh, there are three main ways the endocrine system can control things. It can be hormonal, so that hormones are produced to affect the targets and lead to the ac uh, action that we desire. So hypothalamus produces trophic hormones that affect anterior pituitary gland, which produces trophic hormones that affect various peripheral endocrine glands to produce the hormones that cause the action. And there's lots of opportunities for negative feedback within here, so that when you have plenty of hormone present, things that stimulate the production of the hormone are turned off. Neural Control, neural control, nervous system directly controls an endocrine gland to produce the hormone. And when the action occurs, it turns off the nervous system. And also blood composition. The organ or structure checks the composition of the plasma of the blood. If it changes uh, appropriately, this will cause the endocrine gland to produce the hormone. So the target cells causes an action. Uh, when the blood's uh, composition changes back to what is ideal, this is acts as a negative feedback to turn this system off. So again, negative feedback to always maintain a certain level of concentration of the hormone to maintain a certain response so that we have our various functions in our body tightly controlled and maintained around what is ideal. So you eat a big sandwich, glucose blood levels rise up, pancreas detects this, releases insulin, which affects the liver and other cells of the body to take up the glucose out of the bloodstream. Glucose levels return to normal. This now deactivates the pancreas and stops producing insulin. The hypothalamus, part of the brain, it turns out the hypothalamus, and it's down here, right here, is the master control of the endocrine system by controlling the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland, as seen here in purple, has two parts, anterior and posterior lobes. 
Uh, the hypothalamus will send out hormones that control the activity of the anterior pituitary gland, producing hormones to stimulate it to release new hormones, inhibiting hormones to cause it to stop producing hormones. And these hormones travel via the hypophysial portal veins to a separate capillary bed. So the hypothalamus releases hormones into this capillary bed. It travels through the hypophysial portal into this capillary bed to affect the anterior pituitary glands, anterior lobe. And this is called a portal system because you have two, uh, veins connecting two capillary beds. Very rare. Anterior pituitary gland produces growth hormone that stimulates growth in many, many body tissues, including muscle, soft, and adipose tissue. Prolactin, which stimulates blood, milk production in mammary glands. Thyroid stimulating hormone that stimulates the thyroid to release its thyroid hormone. Uh, so, for instance, the uh, thyroid hormone releasing hormone is released by hypothalamus, stimulates the anterior pituitary gland to release the thyroid stimulating hormone, goes into the bloodstream, reaches the thyroid gland, causes it to release the thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone goes out and does a bunch of stuff, and the higher levels of thyroid hormone then negatively affect the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary gland. Fourth up for the anterior pituitary gland is the adrenal corticotropic hormone. This stimulates the adrenal cortex to release corticosteroids. And then the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, these hormones affect the gonads, either the testes or the ovaries, to affect their production of sperm or oocytes. So if there's a disorder leading to hyposecretion, low levels of growth hormone, this could lead to a pituitary dwarfism, if someone does not grow as tall as normally expected. And if there's a hypersecretion of growth hormone, this could lead to gigantism, where the person grows much taller than expected. The posterior pituitary gland has stores hormones produced by the hypothalamus to be released when a nerve impulse from the hypothalamus says to do this. One hormone is the antidiuretic hormone. This is released to counter dehydration. It increases water retention by the kidneys so that our urine is more concentrated. It causes vasoconstriction of blood vessels which will increase blood pressure. This is a response to low blood volume caused by dehydration. Low blood volume would lead to low blood pressure, so we want to increase the blood pressure in response. The other hormone is oxytocin, the cuddle hormone. In females, it will stimulate uh, the uterine wall during, for muscle contractions during the birth of a child, and also stimulates milk ejection, the release of milk in the mammary glands. In males, it stimulates smooth muscle contractions in the male reproductive tract, and overall, oxytocin makes people like other people better. Thyroid gland is found under the thyroid cartilage. It produces uh, thyroid hormones, thyroxin and triiodothyronine. These help to regulate overall energy metabolism, increase the rate at which cells use up energy from carbohydrates, increase protein synthesis, stimulates the breakdown and use of lipids, basically the basal metabolic rate. It would be much higher in people who can eat anything and not gain a pound, much lower in people who have trouble with the weight. Uh, it also, thyroid gland also secretes calcitonin. Calcitonin responds to calcium levels in the blood being too high. When it's released, it lowers blood levels of calcium and phosphate ions. It does this by stimulating osteoblasts. Osteoblasts build up bone tissue, take calcium out of the blood, also inhibits osteoclasts to prevent the breakdown of bone tissue. And it also increases uh, ion secretion, calcium ion secretion in urine to get rid of excess calcium. Then we get the parathyroid glands. They are on the opposite sides of the posterior sides of the uh, thyroid gland. Uh, they release, produce the parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is released when calcium levels are too low. So they want to increase the amount of calcium in the bloodstream. They do this by stimulating osteoclasts. Osteoclasts break down bone tissue, releasing calcium into the bloodstream. They also tell the kidneys to conserve calcium and not secrete it in urine. And they tell uh, the production of vitamin D to be increased because vitamin D will cause the, the intestines to increase absorption of calcium, get more calcium into the body. So parathyroid Hormones are released, they go into the bloodstream, they cause increased release of calcium from bones, they cause the kidneys to conserve calcium ions so we don't secrete as much, and also the kidneys to release the active form of vitamin D. Vitamin D will then cause the intestines to absorb more calcium ions, getting more calcium into the bloodstream. Um, when the calcium levels get high enough, the parathyroid glands will be told to shut off the production of parathyroid hormone. Adrenal glands. Adrenal glands are basically two different glands in the same place. You have the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. Adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine, commonly known as adrenaline. 
These are often released at times of stress to join a fight or flight response. The release causes the sympathetic division of the unknown nervous system to get stimulated, leading to all the various responses you would expect, say, when you're really scared. The adrenal cortex produces a ton of different steroid hormones. Uh, one example is aldosterone, a mineral coracoid. It causes the kidney to conserve sodium ions, thereby conserving water, and also to excrete potassium ions. So it makes urine more concentrated, conserving water by conserving sodium ions. And this is secreted when blood volume or blood pressure gets low. Uh, cortisol, cortisol is a glucocoroid. It affects the metabolism of various uh, compounds in the body when we're stressed. So it decreases protein synthesis, increases fatty acid release, increases liver production of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, from amino acids and lipids. So, uh, cortical releasing hormone causes anterior pituitary, pituitary gland to release the adrenal corticotropic hormone, goes in the bloodstream, affects the adrenal cortex to release cortisol, which then targets uh, protein synthesis to be inhibited, targets the uh, release of fatty acids, and targets the production of glucose by non carbohydrate sources. Uh, the increased levels of cortisol in the bloodstream will also negatively affect the anterior pituitary gland and hypothalamus, telling them to stop causing more to be produced. And then there's the adrenal sex hormones, a small amount of sex hormones that help to uh, supplement what's released by the gonads and may affect embryonic development. Uh, Cushing disease from hypersecretion of glucocorticoids, uh, you get a strange uh, di deposition of lipids, extra fatty tissue leading to a buffalo hump, a moon face, uh, obesity, you also see weird striations in the abdomen, muscular weakness. And then an adenosine disease, the hyposecretion of some glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids leading to uh, hypotension, low blood pressure, weight loss, fatigue, weakness. Pancreas secretes hormones in the endocrine and digestive system. Uh, so for the endocrine system, we have these pancreatic islets, these little structures in the pancreas that produce glucagon and insulin. Glucagon wants to increase blood levels of glucose. When blood levels are low, glucose levels are low, glucagon is released. So it means to break, break down of glycogen, which is long chains of glucose in some tissues. Glycogen then gets produced into glucose and releases the glucose into the bloodstream. It also stimulates the conversion of non-carbohydrates, proteins, amino acids, lipids into glucose. Insulin. Insulin decreases levels of uh, glucose in the bloodstream. So it releases when there's high levels of glucose to decrease those high levels. It stimulates the liver to form glycogen and various cells and structures to take in glucose from the bloodstream. It also stimulates protein synthesis and production of fat. So uh, glucose levels are too high, stimulates production of insulin to lower the levels of glucose by causing structures to absorb and use glucose. Glucose levels too low, stimulates release of glucagon, which then causes glycogen to be broken down and count the glucose to be produced and released into the bloodstream. Diabetes caused by not producing enough insulin, type one, the person's immune system destroyed the cells that produce insulin, type two, uh, they just cells stop responding to insulin, so it can increasingly produce more and more insulin and eventually they just can't produce enough insulin to lead to the response desired. Melatonin is produced by the pineal gland. It helps to generate our sleep-wake cycle when there's no light, melanin is Released, melatonin is released, causing us to get sleepy. And then when there's plenty of light, it is not released. Uh, the thymus releases hormones, cyclopoietin and thymosin, that lead to the maturation of T cells, important for our immunity. And of course, our uh, ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone. The placenta produces progesterone as well. Testes produce testosterone. And there are other structures like the kidneys and heart that also produce hormones that affect the body and are very important. Stressors, things that cause us to be stressed, that stimulate the sympathetic division of the nervous system. Constant stress can cause lots of problems because it leads to all kinds of psychological and physical changes in our body. This stress can lead to a lot of uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine being released, causing the short-term fight-or-flight response, but it also causes the release of cortisol, which causes long-term adverse effects to our body, affecting fat deposition, affecting protein synthesis, and can cause major health problems.